My name's Stuart Winter and I am the environment editor of the Sunday Express and I've been watching birds and writing about birds for far longer than I care to remember. No day's bird watching in spring is quite complete without seeing a wind chat. For me they are true bird watchers birds. They're nondescript, furtive, diffident and they like to keep their heads down. But if you're a bird watcher and you see one, you really know that it's a fantastic bird. While swallows, nightingales, cuckoos and swifts have created their own legends and folklore, the poor old wind chat has been left out of things. But once you're out bird watching on a spring or autumn day and you catch sight of them, perhaps their stubby little wings fluttering over some gorse or some headland, you know you're onto a great bird. Then you focus in on it. If it's a male, you can be really lucky. It will turn, you'll see its black uh, cheeks, you'll see its lovely honey-coloured upper parts, and then there's that white eye stripe. It looks as if it's been put on by a Hollywood makeup artist. I've been lucky to see wind chats many times on my travels. I've seen them on migration over the Spanish steppes in Extremadura. I've seen them on the Hungarian Pushta. I've seen them on coastal scrub in France and in the lowland slopes of the Apennines. But looking back through my notes, I've only ever heard wind chats sing once, and that's up on the Arctic Circle in the, under the midnight sun. It was in Finland during a bird race, and I came away and realised I'd never actually heard that scratchy call before, that scratchy song before. Yes, the wind chat song is very subdued, I wonder how many bird watchers in the UK have actually heard one. On my home patch in the Chiltern Hills, looking back again through the record books, I realise that they haven't actually bred there since the 60s. They come through in autumn in good numbers, and they go through in spring in smaller numbers, but to actually stay in that habitat that's there for them, there's gorse like this behind me, and there's grassy slopes, I understand that back in the 60s they were still nesting in parts of the country on old railway sidings. But something's happened to them, and that's what we need to find out. During my research about the wind chat, I've been lucky to visit the BTO headquarters up at Thetford. And there the staff have been showing me the marked decline of the wind chat in its most awful form. Looking at the graphs, under my prediction, I see they're going through such a sharp decline that they could become extinct within the next five or six years as a nesting bird in this part of the world. From where I'm standing now, I'm not too far from where the very last red-backed shrike nested in the UK. As you can see behind me, there's lots of gorse, wind as the old English people used to call it, and there's no wind chats in sight. They're slowly, slowly disappearing. They're going without us actually even noticing it. But I really worry whether my children's children will ever get a chance to see the wind chat in the UK as a nesting bird. The wind chat is a summer visitor to our shores, but it spends a good time of the year in Africa. And this is where we have to ask ourselves, is something happening to its population in these southern latitudes? Could it be habitat loss? Could there be something else happening? This is where the work of the BTO and its partners in Africa is so, so important. Through their research, we hope to find some of the answers that's happening to the wind chat. So please give them their support.